Okay, welcome back. This is video 35, New Testament Context. We're on chart 3. Uh, we're at John 14, and I've got uh, verse 17 and 30 about the spirit of truth versus the spirit of error. Actually, it's uh, really uh, here. It's about the spirit of truth. So it's interesting if you uh, read this. Uh, I'll just uh, start at 15 here. If you love me, keep my commands. In other words, follow my follow my law, and this is uh, Christ talking, and I will ask the Father, he'll send you another helper to continue with you forever, the spirit of truth, actually this is just another manifestation of Christ, the uh, way I look at it, because it calls it a him or a he, so it says, whom the world cannot accept, because it neither sees him nor knows him, so none of the people uh, that know Christ uh, will have this spirit of truth. It says, but you will know him, for he will remain with you and will be in you. So it's the uh, a spirit that resides within you for people who care about the truth, in other words, and then he'll help you find the truth. Uh, just like I, I mentioned before, you study uh, the Bible, you can read all the stuff and, and not get the, the context of it unless he shows it to you. And if you have a spirit of truth, I want to know, but... Uh, then you've got to apply what you learn to uh, your life. So you got to be able to stand for the truth, in other words, against all odds. So you just, it's just a long thing. Uh, but one of the points I wanted to make about this, <clears throat> if you let me keep my commands, in other words, follow my law. So this is Christ telling you to follow his law, and he does it a number of times. Down here in verse 21, whoever keeps my commands and regards them, he it is who loves me. And the one who loves me will be loved by my Father. I will love him and make myself known known to him. See, so. And then again, that uh, crosses over to uh, 15, uh, well, mm -hmm. nine, 9 and 10, I guess. Just as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Continue in his love with me. If you keep my commands, you will continue in my love, just as I have kept the commands of my Father. So, Christ followed his own law, and he told you three times right there, uh, if you love Christ, then you have to follow his law, which is exactly why it says over in Revelation 14, if you notice, the victors over Christ, these, uh, and there were the 144,000 in chapter 14, of course, who were pure and all that, and it said they taught the message of Christ, and they followed his law. And the same thing in 12.17. These children of the woman, in Revelation 12.17, it says that they followed God's law and, taught, and, kept the command, and taught the commands of Christ. or uh, Taught the message of Christ, that's what I'm trying to say. So they believed in Christ, they taught his message, which means they, they learned these things, exactly what I'm showing you here. These things that Christ taught, which are, especially we're going to look at all these uh, quotes, in other words, so things that are quoted or things that Christ taught to the apostles or in some cases, like here he's, he's speaking uh, himself, and then he himself quotes things. Uh, for example, Psalms uh, 35, 19, the next one. So let's look at this one. Uh, this kind of goes over to the spirit of truth versus the spirit of error, actually is in 1 John uh, 4, 6. So if we uh, scroll over there, Starts right out in four, do not believe every thinker, but test his teachings, whether they emanate from God. Many false teachers have gone out. By this you can recognize the teacher of God. Every teacher acknowledging that Christ came bodily is from God, and every teacher who does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. Well, really he's talking about the uh, people who run the Son of God who rejected Christ and killed him, and to this day still reject Christ, in other words. So uh, they went on to call themselves Jews, where the people that accepted Christ went on to call themselves Christians, and they uh, separated themselves, but they were all part of the 12 tribes, both uh, groups. Now today, whether the people, like I said, whether the Jews in Israel are part of the 12 tribes or not, uh, is debatable. Uh, most people would say that, no, they're not, because they're Ashkenazis, and they're Shephardim, and they say that they claim that themselves. So... Uh, how can you be part of the 12 tribes if you're, you know. You can look that up and uh, figure that out for yourself. 
But at any rate, uh, we still had, obviously, the people he's talking to at that time, the uh, priests and the Pharisees and all that, were part of the 12 tribes. He identifies them by going back to these uh, references about the people who built the golden calf, the people he kept out of the book of life after 40 years in the desert. He removed their name from the book of lives. And of course, this, they had to be part of the 12 tribes, or what else would they be? So... <clears throat> Christ himself identified them as part of the 12 tribes, and that's kind of what he's talking about here. He's pointing out that these leaders in the synagogues, which you know we would call churches in a sense, but at any rate, they're all rejecting Christ. So the ones that do accept him are the ones you should believe. And he calls them uh, Antichrist, and then uh, of course there's many of them. So anyone that teaches uh, the law without teaching a uh, message of Christ. So then in uh, 4, 6, yeah, it says, They belong to the world, speaking to the ones who reject Christ. Their conversation is worldly, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever recognizes God listens to us. Whoever does not perceive from God regards us not. By this we can discern the spirit of truth as well as the spirit of error. So, <clears throat> If you teach Christ, in other words, you, you have the spirit of truth within you. That's the uh, idea. But the, there's other uh, cross references here is to Luke uh, 10, 18, where he talks about Satan falling from heaven. Uh, Ephesians, uh, let me see what I put marked here. I guess I've kept uh, Ephesians 2, 2. So let's look at that one. Uh, start with two, and you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you then walked, following this age of the world, under the authority of the prince of darkness, of the spirit of him now working in the, uh, and what does it say up there, children of disobedience. Yes, so he identified these children as being members of the twelve tribes, but it says they revolted from him, and we're going to see that here in some of these other verses. But they were obviously part of the 12 tribes. Now, <clears throat> so they chose, in other words, they chose to re, uh, uh, revolt from the idea of Christ or God or whatever. But then they said that, oh, we follow his law and they want to, uh, you know, teach you about the law and all that. But in fact, they, they never followed his law. And that's exactly what... Uh, Christ says to them face to face that uh, he wasn't, they weren't his children, they don't follow his law, that they were uh, whitewashed tombs. And of course, we, our whole list here is all about that. <clears throat> so let's go back to uh, John uh, 15, 6 and 20 to 25, which is where it quotes uh, Psalms. So, the good thing about this is the allegory of the vine in uh, John 15. I am the true vine, my father is the cultivator. So, the branches, as he uh, shows, <clears throat> every, so let's read it. every branch on me not bearing fruit, he removes it, he prunes every fertile branch, so that it may become even still more productive. As for you, you are already pruned by means of the message which I have delivered to you. So, the message of Christ uh, is that pr you're pruning, in other words. Remain on me, for I am with you, as the branch cannot be fruitful of itself. In other words, you need Christ to be fruitful, unless it remains upon the vine, so neither can you, unless you remain on me. I am the vine, you are the branches. So, here again is your allegory of the vine and branches as... Uh, people who either accept Christ or don't accept Christ is the idea. He who remains on me and I with him produces plenty of fruit, but severed from me you can produce nothing. Anyone not remaining on me is at once thrown away as a branch and withers. They are then collected, thrown into the fire and burned. So that's the idea of the wheat and the tares. Absolutely uh, people who either accept Christ or reject him and he's not talking about anyone outside of the 12 tribes. The whole context is the 12 tribes. Now, in 20 through 25, and of course, uh, 
we mentioned about uh, if you keep my commands. So the context, if you just notice, he always has this context of teaching to his people, my people, which are the twelve tribes. The whole context of the New Testament is the same. So he mentions, I have chosen you, in other words, that was verse 19, from out of the world, for that reason the world hates you. So in other words, that's the concept of the chosen, so he chose not just some of the twelve tribes, but the ones he's ch talking about who were chosen are the ones who accepted Christ. Obviously the chosen are not the ones who rejected Christ. So, again, that's why I tell people it makes no sense to pay any attention to Jews in Israel who reject Christ. They've, they've never accepted Christ. You don't see some big Christian uh, country over there. They don't even want Bibles. You know, so how do you figure they're chosen? No, the chosen, as he just pointed out, are the ones who keep his commands and teach the message of Christ. Who have the spirit of truth within them. Those are the chosen. Doesn't make any sense to say, well, just because I'm an Israelite, I'm chosen, right? If they persecute me, they will also persecute you. If they had obeyed my message, so here he's making discrimination between the ones who accept Christ, the ones who don't, and he's saying the ones who don't basically are in leadership leadership positions where they are able to persecute you. See, in other words, they're in positions of government. Things where they can bring, uh, you know, officers and, uh, you know, so forth uh, against you to arrest you, to seize you, to take you to court, just like they did the, the apostles. What did they do to the apostles? They sent out officers and seized them and, and put them in jail and then brought them into court. Well, obviously, today we would just call those police. And then we got multiple levels of police. So, here again... These people, like I said before, are ones, nobles, judges, and all these people who are in these positions of government who have the power to persecute Christians, which is exactly what Revelation is all about. Revelation is all about attacking the Christian people, and as I pointed out, it's the same people, or the same context, you know. The beast, that's what a beast government is, it pays no attention to Christ or anything Christ teaches, doesn't acknowledge him, and it attacks Christian people specifically. Had I not come and spoken to them, this verse 22, they would not have been guilty, but now they have no excuse for their sin. Those who hate me also hate my father. Had I not done among them deeds which have been done by no one else, they would not have been guilty of sin. As it is, they have witnessed and have hated both me and my father. So, here again, he tells you right there, they witnessed these things he's done. He's done things which he's talking about, of course, healing people and uh, raising people from the dead. And he's saying, they've witnessed these things, so they know who I am. And, of course, uh, <clears throat> it's not hard. You can't say that they didn't know who he was. He, he says right there, he came for the purpose of showing them who he was. They witnessed the things he'd done, and they've hated him and his father. Okay? <clears throat> but this is accomplished. In other words, here's a prophecy. It's accomplished a statement recorded in their law. They hated me without a cause. That's a prophecy, in other words, because it connects to all the other prophecies about the bad figs, the tares. They're, it's a prophecy. When, however, the Helper comes, who I myself will send you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, which proceeds from the Father, he himself will give evidence about me, and you can also corroborate, because you have been with me from the beginning. <clears throat> so, well, and then he goes on in 16, they will expel you from the synagogue. So he points out who he's talking about, the people in the synagogues, people in government, positions, nobles, and people running things. So we would say the top, uh, the 1% or people uh, in control of the government at the top that can make things happen. Who write laws and all that kind of thing and can help enforce these laws even though they're not uh, real laws. So this uh, quotes Psalms 35, uh, 19. I wrote in there 35, 19 to 21. But the point about that is, is uh, and I said that the bad figs, of course, 
of the house of Judah, same context as Jeremiah, which we just seen a few uh, few verses back in uh, John 12. All right, so uh, the point about that is, is that also cross references to Romans 3:10 through 18. But over in Romans, it quotes six different verses, most of which are also in Psalms. So the reason I put this together and went ahead and put all these quotes on here, because yes, we'll get to Romans eventually, but the point of the fact is, this all fits together to give us uh, the context of Psalms, because if you want to know in Psalms who it's talking to in Psalms 35, and when we look over at Romans, well, here he's quoting Psalms 5, 9, and 10, 10, well, you know, obviously specific quotes, but I'm putting 10, 2 to 11, 14, 1 to 4, 36, uh, 1 to 4, 140, 2 to 5, and then Isaiah 59, 2 to 18. So the point is on the context is these six verses is what gives you the context for what Psalms 35 is, which is this quote right here in John. So <clears throat> let's, uh, let's go to Psalms 35 and then we'll and we, you can go over to Romans, uh, but it's just these quotes, and, and we've got them all here. So, talking about the context is the same in Romans. It's these people who hated Christ, you know, who killed him, and that kind of thing. So, let's just go back to Psalms and start with that. So, in uh, 19 to 21, approximately. But... If you uh, notice that these people who hated Christ without a cause, these who knew everything about peace, but of things that will trouble the land, they reflect as a means of revolt, so they open their mouths against me, blah, blah, blah. Okay, well, who were, they? Who were these people? Well, if you just back up, actually, most of us, all of Psalms 35 is pointing out these people who hated Christ, because it starts out at the very top, against my opponents. O oh Lord, lead the fight, the fight, seize your shield. So here's the idea of Christ the shield, and come on to my aid. So these are people against David, in other words. <clears throat> I will come to save you, bring shame and disgrace to all who seek for my life, repulse and reprove those who plot for my wrong. So the ones who are, you know, and that's the problem. These people who are against David, it's the same context as these people who are against the Christian people in this country is the leadership. It's the leadership who are destroying your country, and these are people that you're electing. Well, they're having, uh, you know, the whole layout of how you're supposed to elect people for your government is in Scripture. We just don't follow it, and pastors don't teach it. Otherwise, we probably would follow it if you knew about it, but we don't. So here's the idea of Christ the Rock. Let them be like chaff to the wind. So there's your tares. And it's when the Lord's angel pursues. He's talking about Christ, of course. Christ the rock. Let their pathway be slippery and dark. So he's talking, if you just read through here, here he's just talking about these ceaseless haters who hated him without a cause, the bad fix, and the whole context of this. Then he gets down, then my life will be glad in the Lord. In other words, after the Lord takes on these people who are against David. Same things, the people who are against Christ. Rejoice in salvation from Him. In other words, talking about, uh, David talking about having salvation from Christ. And then all my bones will say, Lord, who like you saved the weak from the strong, from their robbers, the poor, and oppressed. So, it's talking about Christ saving, giving salvation. False witnesses rose against me, verse 11. So there you go. You just read on through. All of those people he's talking about who are against him, that is this, the whole idea of those who hated. Those are all bad figs. And you notice in verse 24, though, Lord, judge by your standard of right. Well, that's the whole idea of Christ, the standard, or the Israel people uh, being the standard that all others will be judged by. Over the... Over, and over me let them not triumph long, so, or think that they destroyed them. Shame and degrade those who laugh at my wrongs. All right. So, obviously David had to repent many times, so they, uh, 
In other words, if you did something wrong. And again, 36, uh, one of these in Romans was 36, one to four. So if you just continue on, he's still in context about these people, the bad figs. There's no reverence of God in their sight. When he smiled with his eyes on his lies, but he will find out his vile sin. His mouth utters lies and revolt. He mediates fraud on his bed. Is firm in his path of no use. He never rejects what is bad. So, same context. However, if you just keep going, you'll notice that uh, uh, changes to the people. Uh, Adam's sons who trust your canopy's shade. They're fed by the fat of your house. This will be uh, 36 uh, 9. And they drink of your health giving streams for you, it, for with you is the fountain of life. So there you go. He's talking about the people who accept him and what he'll do for the people that accept him. So <clears throat> all of Psalms, or most of it, is all about the people who accept Christ versus the people who are against Christ. And you just continue on through 37, you've got it all through here. It's all it's in all of these. Or most of them, anyway. Now, so if you look back then to Psalms 5, 9, which was your first quote back here. Well, if you just start with 5. Listen, Lord, to my words and attend to my thoughts. Hear the voice of my cry, my King and my God, for to you I will pray. At Lord, dawn, hear my voice. I wait watching for dawn. For you, God, love not wrong, so the wicked hate you. The proud cannot endure the approach of your eyes. You hate slaves of vice. You destroy liars' paths. Men of blood and rebellion, Jehovah abhors. Yeah. But I, for your mercy, will enter your house, and the holy temple will reverently bow. So, Lord, in your righteousness, lead me along, yes, my traveling direct in the face of your path. Yeah. So then he goes back, the people of uh, the bad faiths, for there is no trust in their mouths, their breast is a wide open grave, which is mentioned in another place. They have no fear of God before them and all that kind of thing. With their tongue they but utter deceit, overthrow them, O Lord, by their enemies, dispersed by their numerous sins, fell those who revolt against you. Yeah. So, <clears throat> but, the point about that is, it didn't start in five. In fact, Psalms 1, 2, 3, and 4 are all about the wheat and the tares. So they started, actually started out. Psalms 1, 1. Blessed is the man who has not walked beneath the sinner's groves, and not stood in the path of vice, nor sat where scoffers sit. So he's talking about the tares, okay. In other words, the blessed are the ones who uh, believe in Christ and the ones beneath the sinner's grove and the scoffers are the tares, right? Okay, so who in Jehovah's law, law delights and seeks his rules or his law by day and night. So he's talking about the wheat versus the tares. <clears throat> like trees beside the flowing stream. So trees are family trees bearing their fruit. That's the idea, the allegory. Their leaves fade not, that's their children, and they succeed in all they undertake to do. Same context, it says in other places. But not so the bad, they are like chaff. So this is one of uh, four, which winds will drive away. The bad will not attain to rule, nor sinners hold the good. For good men's path the Lord prepares, but breaks the bad men's road. So there again, right there at the very beginning, wheat versus tares. Psalms 2. Why do the heathen range and tribes contrive in vain? Yes, tribes, as Jews against Christ. Those are the twelve tribes that are against Christ. Kings of earth will collect and princes plan as one. In other words, a coalition or a military coalition, depending. Let us break from his bands, strip his cords away. So you just read through that. And then, that, of course, that's about Christ in verse 7. 
you wield, uh, or you govern with an iron rod, you recall that, you wield an iron staff, that's verse 9, that forms or breaks the pots, you recall that from Romans chapter 9. So now you kings of ten, earth rulers now reform, with reverence serve the Lord, and trembling rejoice, his son kiss, lest he grieve, and thus your path be lost. So in other words, if you're not accepted by Christ, you'll be burnt as a tear. So it starts right out with that context. Wheat versus tear. Psalms 3. Lord, how many are my foes? Again, back to the tares. How many rise on me? How many say he has no help from God? Yeah. But you, Lord, are my shielding helm. In other words, Christ the shield. My pride and rising plume. My voice will call the Lord from who from his holy hill replies, and it's talking about New Jerusalem. Alright, so you just continue on, and you can see, all he's talking about wheat, tares, Psalms 4. <clears throat> How long shall men libel my honor who love falsehood and seek for a lie? That's verse 3. Yeah. Then the ones in, in verse 4, the ones who accept Christ, the others are the ones against Christ. Same context, chapter 5, sometimes the whole chapter is only uh, about the ones who accept Christ and repent or something like that, and a whole chapter might be against uh, the people who are against Christ. So, But if you just go through one after the next, after the next, you can see it's wheat, tears, wheat, tears, wheat, tears, and it just continues on. So the whole context starts right out that way. You go up to 10, 2 through, uh, okay, 10, 2 through 11. How long, uh, Lord, will you stand afar and hide in the time of distress when the haughty uh, bad press on the poor? In other words, uh, they're in control. Bad figs are in control. And catching the traps they have set, the wicked in pride of soul boast. In other words, they boast in their pride of soul. Prove greed and despise the Lord, whom the wicked in pride never seeks. In his thought there is never a God. So, at all times his path is perverse. He flings your decrees or your laws from himself. Sneers at each one of their bounds. His heart says he cannot be moved nor ever experience distress, revolt and fraud thus fill his mouth, and falsehood hides under his tongue. In ambush he sits in the streets, and in secret he murders the weak. Just continue on. So, <clears throat> looks like that whole Psalms is about the Jews against Christ. So, there's another quote. Then in 14, 1 to 4. <clears throat> There is no God, the fool says in his heart, foul corruptly, they roll, never practicing good. The Lord from heaven looked on the children of Adam to see if any wisely would follow their God, but the whole were corrupt, none were practicing good, for none would learn that all were working for sin. So, here he's looking to see if there are any that accept him. Very few do, which is reason that's generally... Uh, listed as a remnant are the ones he saves behind. Those are the ones that understand. And then um, just continue on down to the end of 14. Who gives from Zion to Israel victory? Here's the context. When the Lord from captivity brings back his race. So this is when they're, they're in captivity. This is the end time. Brings people back in captivity. He kept a remnant. Okay. And then Jacob will laugh and Israel will be glad. So, again, all 12 tribes. And you can make that uh, point if you look at more, obviously, more verses. You have to look at the overall. And, of course, David talks about uh, Christ the shield, Christ the rock, and Christ the king, which is the way it kind of started. So all, or the scepter, either way you want to look at it. So he knows all about that and redemption and all these things which came from Genesis. So the other one was 140. So let's go to Psalms 140. Deliver me, Lord, from bad men. Preserve me from those who oppress 
who mediate crime in their hearts, who daily assemble for wars, think military industrial complex. So they dart out their tongue like a snake, adder venom, venom is under their lips. Lord God, guard from the hand of the bed, in other words, Christ the shield. Snatch me from the men who oppress. Okay. And then, how does he judge them? You go on down to 10. But the heads that would plot to entrap be caught by the lips of themselves and rain burning coals. In other words, think brimstone, fire and brimstone upon them. It's the whole idea of Revelation. Vile judgments. Then the righteous will sing to your name and the just in your presence reside. So, so if you just go out and, you know, now we're getting close to the end of Psalms and we still got the same thing. Those uh, who trust in Christ, the shield, the rock, and the king. Anyway, let's look at, uh, so that's, uh, we've been through all those. Let's look at Isaiah 59, which is the other quote. Now, uh, 59, 2-18, yeah. Alright, so let's just start at the beginning. The Lord's hand is not cut off from saving, and His ears are not deaf to a sound. If your vices had not made division between you and between your own God, so bad figs, and your sins hindered listening to you. For your hands are polluted with blood, so think uh, wars of aggression. Your fingers are filthy with sin. You speak lies from your lips, and your tongue mutters crime. None pleads for the right, none decides for the truth. So courts, problems in the court, they trust upon tricks and false speech. Conceive mischief and bring forth deceit. They hatch vipers' eggs, they spin spiders' webs, who eats their eggs dies, and who hatches produces a snake. <laughs> okay. Their feet run to evil, a haste to shed innocent blood, is verse 7. And their genius contrivance of crime, their haunts are destruction and ruin. They know no path of peace, no justice is found in their trays. They distort their own roads, all who travel them never know peace. By revolt, deserting the Lord, that's verse 13. So, now, if you continue on in 59, though, he continues talking about the Jews against Christ, and then in 16, and but the oh, okay fifteen but the Lord saw and his eyes were displeased for no justice was done, right? And he saw that there was not a man, and he wondered that none interfered but his own arm. Then save for himself, it supported his rights as armor. He righteousness wore salvation the helm on his head. So you remember that from Ephesians. And wore garments of justice as robes, and energy spread as a cloak, then rose up to punish, rose up to repay to his enemies wrath, to his haters their due, and their due to the isles. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> the interesting thing was I said, well, okay, that's where the headquarters were out of London. That's why he's referring to the isles. Then from the west they shall see the Lord's power, and who's to the west of the isles? If it was London, England, which I said is where all your international banking, the ones that are controlling all this. From the sunrise his glory, in other words the standard, when he comes like a torrent with fierce wind from the Lord drives along and bringing redemption to Zion, driving rebellion from Jacob, so the rebellion, again, from Jacob were the tribes that rebelled or any of the house of Judah or the 12 tribes in general who rejected uh, Christ, in other words. So any of the bad figs from Jacob. 
says the Lord. I will make this my treaty with them, says the Lord. The spirit I place on you and the words that I put in your mouth. He's talking about Hebrews 8, 8, the new covenant to the twelve tribes. Shall not go from your mouth or the mouth of your race or the mouth of the seed of your race. So think posterity of your people, says the Lord, from now and forever. All right. So here you have the standard Christ returning, new covenant, in the end time, forever, and your posterity or your children are in Revelation and the last to the end of it. It talks about the, the leaves, you know, in other words, so the allegory, the branches, the vine, the leaves, limbs, all this kind of thing. We're talking about family trees, right? Posterity, your family tree, same idea. And of course, this continues on through on 59 to 60 and so forth, which uh, we've already taught many times, but it's end time, absolutely end time, especially in the end of 62. Raise the flag over the tribes. It's going to be the standard again. Tell Zion's daughter, your Savior has come. So. He brings his ways with him, his work's been done. They call you blessed people, redeemed by the Lord, and name you the salt for the city not forsaken, which is a city up above. People given a new name up in uh, 62.3. All this is in context. And then the bridegroom is back here in 61, verse 10 and 11. The bride decked with gems. Whereas the earth shoots up her plants. In other words, think 12 crops. And if you bag up, there's your priest in Revelation 1, 6, and 7, 61. Priests of the Lord, your title, the servants of God, who should feed on the wealth of the heathen. And then in verse 8, but make lasting my treaty with you, and your race shall be known to the heathen, your shoots in the midst of the tribes. All who see them, see them will be treated with respect as the race that is blessed by the Lord. Yes, the race... The one family and their posterity, blessed by the Lord. He didn't give it to anyone else. And he says that. And then, of course, the bride the Lord loves, that's uh, 62. Talk about the staff right above, 62.3. Then, uh, no more will call you forsaken, in other words, a town forsaken. No more shall call you your land waste that you shall be named my delight and your country, the bride the Lord loves. Hang up. And then the groom and his bride, verse 5. So, it's all there. It's all in time. It's not something else. Same thing in uh, all of these, all the way up to the end of, of 66. It's all, uh, I can clearly show it's all in time context. So, <sighs> I need a little water here. So uh, that's what we got in John uh, 15 about the people who hated without a cause. Again, I say that that's absolutely a part of the 12 tribes, and we know where it started and it continues all through. And, uh, you know, I guess, uh, <clears throat> like I said in Jeremiah, we saw before, don't pray for them, I won't hear you, and so on and so forth. Uh, he's going to come back, judge them. And, you know, we, we just look at it as like, well, why does he wait 2,000 years? You know, what's all this about? Well, you know, it might not be able to be easy to figure uh, a lot of this out, but at least we can see the context here by looking at your quotes, looking at your cross references, seeing how things connect. There you go. There's your context. And end time context is not that hard to determine in Isaiah what's in time, what isn't. Uh, with others, it can be more difficult. Uh, Psalms, uh, it's just written quite a bit different, but uh, still it's about people, generally Jews against Christ versus uh, those who uh, believe. Of course, when he calls Christ the rock, Christ the shield, blah, blah, blah. Of course, David knew about Christ and redemption. He told people about Christ you know, Christ, and people generally knew about Christ, a savior, uh, whatever, they knew about this king, Melchizedek, uh, David talks about Melchizedek, and so forth. <clears throat> so, 
The twelve tribes were the only one expecting Christ in the New Testament, but here again you have these people and generally their offspring continue the family a problem uh, rejecting Christ. Uh, they want to stay in control and they love the riches and their position of power and they, they don't regard Christ and they don't uh, care if they're uh, rejected and burnt as tares apparently because they just don't see it, they're not capable of seeing it. And uh, you know, so I'm not sure what else to say. We'll could just come back on the next video. Uh, of course, uh, John 16, and uh, the next video will be uh, 36. So uh, thanks for watching, and uh, I am working on this other video about Revela uh, Revelation in general. So people will just be able to go through and teach Revelation a little easier, I think, when I get through with that. So thank you.